Thank you very much, Secretary King. That was um, an incredibly powerful and rich setup for what is now a conversation with all of you. So what the deal is now is this program is being live streamed. So we need you, when you ask a question, to please use a mic. We have two colleagues in the back of the room who have mics, and they'll make sure they get them to you. And I would also say for everyone in the room and for Secretary King, please also introduce yourselves when you ask a question. So with that, it is over to you. And I know I have a lot of questions, so I'm guessing all of you do as well. Um, who would like to be first? Edgar. And forget that I just said that, and go ahead and introduce yourself. <laughs> Hi, Secretary. Uh, well, yeah. Hi, there we go. Uh, my name is Edgar Villanueva. I'm with the Schott Foundation for Public Education. Greetings from our president, Dr. John Jackson. Uh, my question is uh, concerning all of the um, attacks on marginalized students that are happening right now. Um, especially concerned about uh, children of immigrants, uh, you know, dreamers. Um, what do you think could happen with DACA, or what could the educational system be doing to better support these students right now? So I'm very worried about this. You know, we we've, we've been doing the trust a lot of advocacy around DACA, as I know many in the room have. You know, we've got 800,000 folks who are vulnerable, uh, but many more who actually would be eligible but haven't even taken advantage of the program. Um, the uncertainty <coughs> is brutal. You know, when you talk to young people who are um, DACA students, you know, they are in, sort of constantly in fear and watching the news every day and having a hard time keeping track, as we all are, of where the politics are. Um, it's hard to know. I mean, there's a very good possibility we have this week with a government shutdown uh, and continued um, stalemate on the issue of DACA. One of the reasons that's so unfortunate is that I do believe if there was an up or down vote on DACA in Congress, it would pass. So this is really um, a choice that the current congressional leadership and the White House are making. Um, we didn't have to be here. This President, the 45th president's decision to end DACA it created this crisis. Um, you know, the best hope is that this has, I think, galvanized a community of young people and a community around them. You see higher ed presidents and school district superintendents active on immigration issues in ways they have never been before because they see the threat to their students. Um, and hopefully that broader conversation creates a path to a more comprehensive immigration reform uh, solution. We certainly in the Obama administration tried to get there and could not get there with Congress. There are things that we need to change and improve. Um, you know, so I try to stay hopeful. Not very hopeful about the next 48 hours, but I think in the long run, it is inconceivable to me that we as a country would walk away from these young people who are as American as any of us, but for a piece of paper. Right? And, and they are in school. Many of them are teachers. Actually, it's a very large number of uh, documented teachers. Um, I, it's inconceivable to me that as a country we would walk away from these young people. So I, I'm, I remain optimistic that we will get there. Um, I think this debate, though, has revealed um, the degree to which we are all vulnerable. We are vulnerable as a society to those who want to use hate and fear to generate division. And you know, there's a broader conversation we all have to have about the civic education we need to do so that we, as a society, are less vulnerable to this. Um, Sean, and then maybe Cindy, if you can pass the mics after. Yeah, thank you. Is that working? Hi, Secretary, how are you? Sean from the New York Community Trust. Um, Building on your point about health care and other factors that really affect children's ability to learn, the city's toehold on that has really been community schools. But I think in philanthropy, we have struggled with how to leverage that effort to maximize its impact beyond just paying for additional services. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about how to help make sure that community schools' efforts have the intended consequences that they desire? Yeah. I mean, I worry a lot about this issue because I think all of us would agree that 
the premise of wraparound services, the premise of community schools is right. But as you look across the country, there's lots of places that are doing community schools poorly. Uh, and a very mixed body of evidence around the effectiveness of community schools. A few things that we've seen that I think help make community schools work better uh, and deliver more of the promise. Um, one is, if there is no one to quarterback and coordinate the services, it often is lots of people going in different directions without necessarily serving students well. So you need that quarterback, and I worry that in many places the assumption is that the principal or assistant principal will take on managing a bunch of service providers in addition to their regular work, and that doesn't really work. So the, the degree of coordination um, so that you are really responding to the needs of individual families, I, that to me is critical. Two is the connection with school staff. So if the service providers are working over here and school staff are working over here and not talking to each other, and we see that a lot, I think that undermines the intended goal. And in order to really engage the faculty and school staff in supporting students' needs outside of academics, you also have to create time for that, right? So do, do teachers have planning time that is focused on responding to the needs of the most vulnerable students? Do teachers have time to talk with service providers? Is there someone on staff who's tracking the data so that we are leveraging the data that's gathered both within the school and by service providers to support students? Um, fourth, and this is maybe the hardest, if school is still terrible, the out academic outcomes are not going to improve. Like That's not shocking, right? If math is not taught well, if reading is not taught well, if students are not getting science and social studies, if teachers are not getting good professional development are not well supported, the community schools part isn't going to make up for that <laughs> academic failing. And I worry that in some places, and I think this, this is true of some places in New York City, but nationally as well, people say community schools as a way to deflect from actually doing something about the core academic program in the school. And I just think that's never going to get it done. It has to be community schools as something additive to a high quality academic experience. Um, so those are a few of the things that, that would make a difference. And, and it's, again, I think a larger question of political will. And then a management question. Do you have the systems in place to execute well? And if one role that philanthropy can play is to push back when folks come, and I'm sure some in the room are doing that, when folks come and say, well, you pay for this service, to ask the question about the academic program, the management structure, the data sharing, the systems that will support better outcomes. Hi. Hi. Cindy Rivera Weiss. I'm from the Edwin Gould Foundation. Yeah. Great to see you. As we think about our goals for our school system and we think about academics, we think about physical health, mm -hmm. we think about emotion. Okay, we think about emotional health, we think about academically sound instruction, we think about the ultimate determinant of educational success, economic security. What do you feel in light of all these priorities, the role that the, is appropriate for the school system in regard to economic security, ultimately? Mm. Well, a couple things. One is, um, I just was this morning with a group of uh, teachers from around the country and school leaders talking about literacy. And one of the points I made to them is, I think the number now is seven, somewhere between 70 and 80% of the men who are incarcerated in the United States um, dropped out of high school. Um, studies estimate that 50 to 60% of those who are incarcerated are at the basic or below basic level in literacy. Right, so on one level, doing our core job well, making sure that students leave school with the academic skills they need either to be successful in college or successful in a career that will support a family, doing that core job is an economic development strategy. Right? That is, a, to me, our core responsibility. We equip people with those core academic skills that they need to be successful. We are positioning them for greater economic success. That said, I think there's much more we could be doing in high school to support students in the transition to 
post-secondary education or the workforce. Um, you know, I'm optimistic about things like the PTEC program, where, you've, where you have students who are doing, they're getting a high school diploma, they're getting an associate's degree, and they're first in line for a job at IBM. I am, one of the reasons I'm optimistic about it is I, having been a high school teacher, one of the hard things for high school kids is like this question, what is it all for? Why am I here? What am I doing this for? Right? Those of you who have high schoolers at home, you may have heard this, right? Like, why am I learning this? And the connection with the, with the employer or higher ed institution can help make that why question clearer for students. Um, Jobs for the Future did this very large scale study of dual enrollment programs in Texas. Found that students who are in high school are able to enroll in a college course, are more likely to graduate from high school, go on to college, more likely to persist in college, and more likely to graduate from college. Right, so we could be thinking about what, what does a K through 16, really P through 16 system look like in a way that is much more attentive to our long-term economic success. Right? And the bat, one of the best economic drivers in the state is public higher education. And so if we were smarter about the connections between K-12 and public higher ed, I think that would help our, the economic security of families um, and communities. And the last piece I'd mention is multi-generational programs. goes back to this idea of community schools. Um, we've got to ask ourselves, what more can schools be doing as institutions to support um, a multi-generational strategy? So I think about English learners. There's a lot of evidence that English learners will do better if they are getting good um, bilingual opportunities in school, but that their parents are also getting access to language learning. Right? And that, that is something that schools, as we think about a community school structure, could be providing, is access for parents to um, language courses, to job readiness courses. We suffer the consequences in schools of family economic insecurity. And so we ought to be thinking about schools as a part of a kind of a team of community institutions that are working to improve the economic security of families. One of the disappointments, I think, of mayoral control so far in New York, and it's not just in New York, you see this around the country, one of the ideas was that if you had the mayor in charge of the schools and also the other services, right, housing and, um, and uh, social services, that you'd have smarter cross-agency coordination. I don't think we've really seen that fully leveraged here or around the country yet. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for your time and your presentation. I'm Marlin Torres, Senior Program Officer with the New York Life Foundation. And we support out-of-school time programs, uh, particularly that focus on helping middle school youth. I have two questions, so that's the first one. Um, and in terms of, obviously, um, it's we all have to fight for educational justice. I am with you there. Um, uh, it's such a big task. Um, and part of the stats you presented, while always helpful, it's just like, oh God, can we ever do this? Can we ever do this? Um, but then I see hope and optimism in out-of-school time programs and the supports that they provide um, during the school day. And they give, perhaps, what young people are not getting <laughs> during the traditional school day in the out-of-school time and summer. Um, time as well. I'd like to know your thoughts on that and how those programs can help to continue to influence, um, particularly now around some um, social emotional learning, but particularly influence um, the education system. So some of your thoughts there. And the second issue is Puerto Rico. My family is um, from Puerto Rico, so this is very personal. Okay, I promise I wouldn't cry. <laughs> Now everybody's looking at me. But obviously, thanks, yes. But obviously there are um, um, thousands and thousands of young people that are not in school. Um, my cousins, my cousin's kids go to school from 9 to 12, half day. And there's a whole generation of young people that could be lost. Puerto Rican American students. What, if anything, um, 
in, in terms of insights there in the educational system there, can you provide whether the education trust or the partners that you work with, that would be uh, immensely helpful. Thank you. So those two questions. Yeah. yeah. Um, let me start with the second. Uh, you know, my mother was born in Ponce. I, I started my teaching career in San Juan. Um, what has happened there in, in Puerto Rico is outrageous. It is a uh, heartbreaking failure of the administration to do what is necessary. I, I mean, Senator, Senator Murphy from Connecticut made this point. You know, if, if what's happening in Puerto Rico was happening in Connecticut, people would be rioting in the streets, right? Imagine Westchester without power and water for months. Right? You can't, it's like unimaginable because we would never let that happen as a country. So to me, there, you know, there's no way to separate what's happened um, with the relief efforts from the tone around race in this administration. I just, uh, you, you, the reality is there is a willful uh, disregard for the lives of people in Puerto Rico and, and, a, and a willful disregard um, for their rights as citizens to the support of the country, right? I mean, we could build whole cities in the, in the Middle East when we are at war overnight, but we can't get people power and water after months. The state of the school system was bad before because of the economic crisis that we've allowed to happen there. Um, and so I'm really worried about how we get out of this moment. I think the, re the reality is Congress is going to need to commit to a huge investment of resources in order to make it better. Um, you know, all of us, uh, philanthropy and all of us as individuals can give to places like the Hispanic Federation or uh, we do some work with the Flambayan Foundation, you know, with others who are doing work on the ground. But this is, a, this is a problem on the order of tens of billions of dollars over many years that are needed from the, from the federal government. And so this really comes down to congressional advocacy and sort of forcing the administration's hand on getting resources to the island. And then a long-term economic development strategy. You know, because if you think about schools as the vehicle for long-term economic security, the fact that schools are underinvested in higher ed is deep, deeply in despair there. Uh, unless we put resources into the schools and, and into higher ed, there's no long-term economic future. So I, I wish I could be more hopeful, but I think it's incumbent on all of us to organize and to keep this issue front and center. I mean, imagine turning on the news. Right? And you don't, today you can turn on the news, you wouldn't hear. Right? Other than maybe uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda is like trying to keep attention on this and, and, and bless him for that. But you don't hear about Puerto Rico day in, day out. But I tell you, if there was no water or power in Westchester, that'd be the lead story on every news channel. Right? So a part of our job, I think, is to keep it front and center so that we keep the pressure on Congress to act. Um, in terms of the out-of-school time, you know, you had the... the uh, current administration's budget director say, after school programs, oh, those don't work, right? as a justification for eliminating uh, federal funding for the 21st uh, Century Community Learning Center program. So I think we have work to do to make sure that folks understand how critical after school, out of school time, summer programs are. You know, there's a story to tell about the data on summer learning loss, on the difference that it makes in academic outcomes for particularly middle and high school students that have access to high quality experiences after school. I think we, one failing of the sector is that, I don't know that we've always done a good job on data, right? And so, you know, you all have had this experience. After school program, they have great stories about the difference in kids' lives, and then you say, but there's some data around this? Can you show me the attendance better, grades better, court involvement less? And, and many of the providers don't have that. So I think part of what we can do as a, as from a philanthropy standpoint and a policy standpoint is invest in the research and the data, the building of a data um, 
kind of story around the difference that out of school time programs make. Um, and then from a policy perspective, we could get a lot better about coordinating the activities of out of school time providers and school. Um, and this goes back to this question of how to do community school well. In too many places, you know, the, the after school, the person in the after school program knows the kid's family is in crisis, but the teacher and principal and counselor don't. And that shouldn't happen, right? We should have much better, better coordination. Um, two more questions. Well, okay, we've got our two more questions. <laughs> Good afternoon, sir. I'm Nicholas Pelzer, a senior program officer with the Wallace Foundation. Um, working in the philanthropy space, I think, um, I love data. I love evidence. It's what our organization does. I, I imagine it's what most of the folks around here do. But in the current environment of watching um, how uh, structures and the confidence in structures and institutions get eroded and misinformation, I'm curious what your suggestion is about how you make the case in a situation uh, like this. Um, one of the things that as I've grown, I've learned that uh, being right actually isn't the most important thing and having evidence and data isn't necessarily the most important thing. So how do you, how do you shift a mindset and how do you make, um, how do you, I guess, start to rebuild uh, confidence in something like that when the erosion of trust has a lot to do with the fact that folks aren't educated, civically inclined and, 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 and engaged in that way. So I guess my uh, question is, what more than, than building an evidence base can we do toward making a case? Yeah, it's a great question. And then we, you know, at, at Trust, we think a lot about this question because our history has been 25 years of using data and evidence to make the case. If you'd asked me, a year and a half ago to name a bipartisan issue, I would have said, oh, the evidence agenda. Republicans and Democrats committed to using evidence of program effectiveness to make decisions about resource allocation. That is gone, that bipartisan consent. So a few things I think we need to do. One is those of us who care about data and evidence also to remember that people don't remember numbers very well and that we've got to tell stories. Um, you know, one of the things we, we've done recently is try to connect data and storytelling. So um, you, know, you, have, you have folks out there, including my successor, saying public education can never work, doesn't work, and, you know, irretrievably broken. And so what we've done is, the, and, and you know this from work that, that we've been involved in together, uh, there's this very large data set that Sean Reardon at Sanford put together showing districts that are doing better than would be predicted by their demographic. And a person on our team went to those districts and interviewed folks and tried to tell the story of what's happening in places that are doing better than would be expected. Told the story, for example, of the gains that Chicago has made over the last couple of decades that are quite impressive. And we made a podcast about it because we also realized we've got to communicate in different ways. But trying to translate data and evidence into stories that are memorable, that will stick with people. I think part of what's moved the DACA conversation, you look at the national polling data, you got 80% support for codifying DACA. That's partly because I think activists have been smart about having students and teachers and the beneficiaries tell their story. Folks who are serving the military tell their story. And I think that has helped move the national conversation. So storytelling is one. Two, I think we've got to be much more intentional about organizing. And that means we've got to invest in organizing. right? And so many times, folks are busy. Folks have a lot going on in their lives. And they may not know what the current issue is on which their activism is needed. But you saw in Century Foundation a lot of work on this with healthcare, defending Obamacare. Right? When people understood that their health care, their, their, their parents' health care was in jeopardy, people got organized in a different way. They called Congress. They showed up. They went to events. And so the organizing work requires investment. And again, oftentimes foundations will say, well, we don't invest in organizing. Like, we don't invest in policy. We just do direct service. But organizing is part of what's necessary to protect 
the direct services in which we are investing and to move policy in the right direction. So investing and organizing. And the third piece, I think, is we've got to, we've got to go where people are and tell the story in places where they will listen. And so, I, you know, if you look at folks under uh, 30, they're not watching the nightly news. In fact, they're not watching cable news at all, right? They're gathering their information from social media. So if we say social media, we don't do that. You know, sometimes people say, oh, I, I, that Twitter and Facebook, I don't do that. But that's where the people are. And so if we want to organize people, and you see it with the Women's March, Right, part of why the Women's March was able to reach the scale it did was through smart social media organizing. Now, we've also seen social media used as a force for evil, I would argue. But it's going to be a force in our lives. So the question is, is the force for evil or force for good? And we've got to be active if we're going to make it a force for good. And so I, I think there's, a, there's a telling the story in unusual places. You know, some, I, sometimes, so when I was secretary, I went on, and then afterwards, I went on the Chelsea Hammer show. I've been on the Chelsea Hammer show multiple times. <laughs> Chelsea's great. She's fantastic and really cares about equity issues. And wherever I go, I tell you this, it's so crazy. I was in downtown New York, near, like near Wall Street. I'm walking along. This person stops me. He says, I know who you are. And I thought, oh, because I was in government. Nope because I was on the Chelsea show, and she remembered from the Chelsea show. So, you know, I think telling our story on venues that people pay attention to, right? There's a whole audience that's not going to read an Ed Truss white paper as much as I would love them to. <laughs> um, but they are watching Chelsea Handler, so we've got to be there to tell the story. I think President Obama was so good at this, and the First Lady, Mrs. Obama, so good at this, figuring out how do we get to people where they are to tell the story. Hi. Hello. Good to see you again. Yeah. Um, I'm Gisela Alvarez from the Donors Education Collaborative at the New York Community Trust. And we fund organizing and policy advocacy around the New York City Public Schools. Um, you and I have had a couple conversations over many years about... Like 25, yeah. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We went to college together. Um, and I'm curious, and I think over those years and in those different roles, we've, we've both um, changed some of our positions, um, could say certain things, couldn't say certain things. So I'm, I'm curious, because we talked about this when you were a commissioner, and you touched upon it in your speech, which was um, kind of like our mission statement for our fund. So it was, thank you, um, about segregation. Mm -hmm. um, and you've told, we've talked about both rezoning, dual language, magnet, all of those things. Um, you know New York City schools. Um, we've had conversations here. Mm -hmm. We've, I think the city's starting to have a conversation now. But I feel as if we're still sort of in a very conversational mode. So I'm curious to hear, now that you are where you are, what next? Yeah, you know, I mean, this is a this is a thing that I'm, you know, been working on throughout the public policy roles that I had when I was in New York. We did when I was state commissioner. We created this grant program to try to foster, as you know, try to foster socioeconomic integration efforts. Um, and my experience was that the political resistance is very high. I think that I think that has moved somewhat. Um, partly, I think through the work of the Century Foundation and Rick Kallenberg and others, partly through uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones and the things that she's um, written for the New York Times. Um, but I think, the, I think the conversation has moved somewhat and the, the political environment is different. That said, you know, we, we proposed to Congress, President Obama proposed to Congress in his final budget, a significant pool of funding for school diversity efforts. Couldn't get Congress to act on it. We then created a small grant program for districts to plan for socioeconomic integration efforts. And one of the first things my successor did, in the first two or three things, in the first two or three weeks of the administration, was to revoke that grant program. And give the money back to Treasury. It's not like even the money is even being used for another purpose. Just give it back to the Treasury. Um, so we still have political challenges to overcome. I, 
a, a couple observations. One is I think that we are, not, we are unlikely to get to a place, despite all the advocacy, where you have um, state level or federal level policy that directs um, a reorganization of schools to achieve racial balance. I, I, it is very unlikely to me, given the series of Supreme Court cases we've had, um, it seems very unlikely to me that you're going to have a national policy to direct um, you know, bus, uh, busing, a mandatory busing program. That said, the evidence is people can buy in to diverse schools if they are confident that's going to be good for their kid. I don't think you can overcome that. I don't think you can ever say to somebody, I want you to do this thing that's bad for your kid because it's better for society. That is not, I just think that is not a viable path. So, so what you see in a place like Hartford, of course there was a court decision there, but what you see in a place like Hartford is they've been able to attract white suburban families into the city because there are programs they really want. Dual enrollment programs they really want, arts programs they really want, Montessori-style programs that they really want, and that's, been, that's attracted people. I think the same is true in the city. I think if, they, if you opened uh, programs, we see this with dual language, we see this with arts and STEM, if you open programs that middle-class white parents want, then there is an enthusiasm, and people see the diversity as additive. I think most, uh, certainly urban white millennial parents would say they would rather their kid be in a school that is diverse. They just want to make sure that's a good school. And you know, are there issues of racial bias and so forth that, that affect how people perceive school quality? Of course. But I think we can overcome that if we structure the approach in the right way. But we can't do it just by talking. We actually have to be very intentional. Uh, and I worry that the, you know, the history in the city over, over the last few years has been just to do the talking and not to really take this on fully. And to me, taking it on fully would be to do things like what Montgomery County has done, which is to be very intentional about saying, we're going to create these programs. We're going to set aside seats to ensure racial and socioeconomic diversity. Um, you know, we're going to make hard choices to get there. And that's a political will question. You know, the mayor talked about this during the reelection campaign. I hope that he is serious about it, and I hope that we will see in the next chancellor and the next administration a, a, a more thorough commitment to this work. And then we've all got to create cover, too, for folks. And we've got to stand up, because some people will be mad. right? We saw that when, with some of the efforts in Brooklyn and the Upper West Side, people putting up signs in the lobby, you know, come to this meeting, otherwise our property value is going to go down because there's going to be kids of color in our school. Right? And we, we know that's going to happen. We've got to be prepared to push back, to explain, to help build understanding. And that can't just be on the city. I think that also has to be a community-wide effort. Um, Secretary King, thank you for what has been, I think, an extraordinary opportunity for all of us to have a critically important conversation. So um, first, please join me in thanking Secretary King. Um, I want to thank the Century Foundation for helping us get him here, so thank you for that. Um, and Dick, our thanks to you for letting us honor Janice's memory with our first policy forum. I think the conversation and the themes we heard would have made her very happy. Um, and board alumni, thanks for getting all these people in the room. So now we have an opportunity to enjoy one another's company. Please have a glass of wine and a toast to Janice. So thank you. <laughs>